Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much for coming. Um, I'm delighted to be here today to address uh, Tom Etu University students as part of the Diplomacy Vote Barish Seminary series of talks. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and it's, uh, it's great to see so many of you have, um, have come along as well. Um, I should thank, I think, Professor Dr. Guven Sack who, as you know, uh, is the rector of the university for, I think, uh, initiating this idea and for um, allowing uh, foreign diplomats like me to, to have the podium. But I should particularly also thank Professor, Il sorry, Professor Isan Sezai, the Dean of the Faculty of Economics and Administrative Sciences and, of course, Associate Professor Shaban Karadash as well for extending the invitation. So I'm going to speak to you today about uh, British-Turkish relations and uh, the Brexit referendum. Um, I'm going to start off by saying that British-Turkish relations have historically been very good. And the essential reason for this is probably to do more to do with geography than anything else. That because uh, we sit at opposite ends of the European continental mainland, um, and because for most of British history the problems that Britain has had to contend with have come from France and Germany and the continental mainland, uh, Turkey and the Ottoman Empire have not actually been enemies of ours for most of the time that we've existed as a nation state, and for a lot of the time I'm not sorry, my pleasure. So, um, for a lot of the time, actually, we've seen Turkey as a natural ally against uh, other problems in Europe. For example, just to take the last couple of hundred years very briefly, and uh, I'll get on to Brexit, sorry about this. So, uh, in 1798, uh, Sultan Selim III gave Admiral Lord Nelson, a British, famous British naval officer, a piece of jewellery called a chelink which was diamonds and a uh, wonderful sort of uh, affair that, he, that Nelson used to wear in his hat uh, as a gift for Nelson winning the Battle of the Nile against the French that stopped French attacks and, in, and stopped the French ambition in uh, Egypt, then part of the Ottoman Empire. In the mid-1800s, as you will know, uh, the United Kingdom looked to the Ottoman Empire to balance the attempts by Russia to increase its influence in the Eastern Mediterranean. And indeed, we went to war uh, with France and the Ottoman Empire as our allies against Russia in order to push back uh, Russian expansionism at the time. The First World War was a blip or a, was a counterexample of what was otherwise quite a long-standing friendship. But after the First World War, we were back together as friends between the wars, we had a mutual defense uh, treaty. And indeed, of course, after the Second World War, um, there was the joint experience of the Korean War, where we were together on the same side. And then we were together as partners uh, and allies in NATO. So the, I, I don't know if you've ever, any, any of you have read a book by a British journalist and author called Tim Marshall, which, he, which is called Prisoners of Geography. But it's quite an interesting introduction to the relationship between geography and strategy and national interests. And I think help exp helps explain why uh, the Ottoman Empire and now Turkey and the United Kingdom are sort of natural partners because of where we sit at either ends of, uh, of the European continental landmass. Anyway, um, I mean, more recently, of course. Um, after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the kind of sense of a new order in international affairs, this moment of hope that we all felt uh, globally that things were changing for the better, we were entering an era of cooperation. Um, that was also the time when Turkey put in its application to join uh, the European Union, um, and that application was deliberated and eventually was successful. And the United Kingdom within the European Union was one of the strongest supporters of Turkey's European ambitions. Because not only was Turkey a long-established friend, but we had a sense of the strategic importance 
of Turkey's journey towards <coughs> European Union membership and the benefits that that would bring not only to Europe but to Turkey's immediate region and indeed uh, to Turkey herself. Um, of course, that hasn't ended up, or at least the stage that we are at now, looks rather less hopeful, uh, not just for Turkey's accession, but maybe also for those hopes that we had of a new world order after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, but that's perhaps a story for another occasion. Let me say one or two things about the modern um, bilateral relationship between Turkey and the United Kingdom in 2019. Well, it's characterized by excellent contacts between our political leaderships from the very top downwards. Um, to illustrate that, uh, your president, President Erdogan, uh, visited the United Kingdom in May last year with a very large entourage of ministers. I should know the number. It was either eight, eight or nine or ten ministers. It was a very large delegation. You can imagine the protocol issues. Um, we had a large group of ministers, and of course it brought a lot of honour to us. We understood this was, this was a signal of the importance of the relationship with the United Kingdom for the President and the Turkish government. Um, and when the President was in Britain in May, of course he saw Her Majesty the Queen, um, and he saw the Prime Minister, uh, and uh, the red carpet was generally rolled out uh, for him and his colleagues. But there have also been many other very high-level visits. Our Prime Minister, Theresa May, was here um, in January of the previous year. And um, uh, the then Prime Minister, Benali Yildirim, was also in the, in the UK um, um, in, what year is it now? The end of 20... I'll get this wrong. The end of 2017, I think. And the point is, top visits between our top politicians go back and forwards uh, all the time, and they're an important part of establishing the signals to our two administrations that this relationship matters to both governments very much. Um, trade is another important component. Uh, we set ourselves the objective, Britain and Turkey, we set ourselves the objective um, two years ago of achieving uh, a trade volume of $20 billion a year. In 2017, we hit the target, we uh, exceeded our target, and our bilateral trade in both directions was $23 billion, according to UK figures. Um, that means, and this isn't disputed, that means that Britain has become Turkey's second largest export market. So we're in a really important uh, export market for Turkish industry. That trade grew by 15% in 2017, and is still growing now, despite uh, the uncertain environment that we live in. And for the UK, we sell more goods to Turkey than we sell to Russia or to China, which shows the importance of the Turkish market to us. For Turkey, you may be pleased to hear that your trade relationship with Britain is one of the few big trading relationships you have in which you have a trade surplus. You sell more to us than we sell to you by quite a significant margin. But uh, we're pretty relaxed about that as long as the overall trade is growing. Uh, because after all, uh, the reason why we buy so many Turkish imports is because our businesses and our consumers want to buy things that you make here. So uh, you know, we're pleased that the relationship is as strong as it is. And when you look at investments in each other's countries, um, some very big UK names are present in Turkey, such as Vodafone. I think they're the second largest foreign investor in Turkey overall. Shell, BP, BAE Systems, Rolls-Royce, and many more are here. And in Turkey, Turkey's bought, rather in Britain, Turkey's Yildiz Holding, for example, has bought a big company called United Biscuits. Beko, I think, sell more washing machines and dishwashers uh, and fridges and other goods uh, in the UK than I think almost any other company. They're tremendously successful. And um, if you want a coffee in Britain and you find yourself in London, you will find that Carve Dunyas uh, is never really far away. And if you're feeling very nostalgic and you need a simit, then I can assure you around the corner there will be simit saraya. So, you know, we're mutually investing to each other's benefits all the time. 
Away from trade, um, we have very important cooperation uh, against terrorism, and we have very important cooperation against uh, serious organized crime, and we cooperate strongly too on some of the big challenges, uh, such as uh, unregulated migration. Of course, I mentioned, the moment I mentioned terrorism and migration, I'm immediately conscious that Turkey is right at the front line of these challenges that affect us all, but are, at this present time are certainly affecting Turkey much more than many other countries. <coughs> uh, one last thing to mention, this, this list could be quite a long list of our bilateral relationship, but just one more thing I'd mention, which is people-to-people -people contacts. Whether we're talking about student numbers, which are not very high at the moment, but are growing, or whether we're talking about business exchanges, which are getting strong all the time, or whether we're talking about tourism, which has there's an interesting story about tourism. After the failed coup of 2016, of course, a lot of... And, and, the, and the terrorism that was happening in Turkey at the time, which worried tourists, tourist numbers dropped off dramatically in, in Turkey. I'm very pleased to say that the outturn, the outturn of British tourist visitors to Turkey in this last year, in 2018, looks as though it's gone back to the same level it was, maybe even slightly higher, than uh, before the problems started. So British people are coming to Turkey in large numbers once again, and I'm told that for the British company Thomas Cook, big tourist company, that the uh, most popular single destination globally for Thomas Cook uh, travelers, Thomas Cook tourists, was Antalya. So I think, again, this shows that Turkey is very, very much back on the map for British people coming on holiday. And that, in an informal way, outside the structures of government, is a very important part, too, of our bilateral relationship. I should say, of course, part of the reason why the government-to-government -government relationship is strong is the position that the British government took in the immediate aftermath of the failed coup of July 2016. That, uh, as you may remember, um, the British government uh, quite quickly condemned the coup. For us, the attempted coup, there was, there was no difficulty in identifying the difference between a democratically elected government, um, a government that was formed and established according to the Constitution, and an attempt at state capture by a criminal organization. And that has remained our position ever since. Uh, and I think it was appreciated that we expressed our support and solidarity with the Turkish government as quickly as we did, and that one of our ministers from the Foreign Office, newly appointed, dropped everything, and within three days of the coup was in Ankara, seeing for himself the damage that had been done to the parliament and other buildings, and talking to Turkish ministers. And I think that was an important signal at the time, which um, continues to be something that refreshes um, our relations. Uh, and as well, I would say, too, that the action taken by British police in the United Kingdom against the PKK, where we have done everything we can within the law to prevent or uh, to disrupt the activities, fundraising or other activities of the PKK, I think that is also very much appreciated here in Ankara. That's the good news, I hope. And now we move on to uh, the challenge, which is the Brexit part of this, uh, of this discussion. Um, on the 23rd of June, 2016, um, the United Kingdom held its referendum as to whether or not Britain should remain inside the European Union as a member state or leave. Most of us went to bed the night before the referendum convinced that the British public would vote to remain in the European Union. The economic, welfare, security and other arguments seemed overwhelmingly in favour of remaining inside the European Union. Uh, that there were very few people that predicted that we would, the British people would vote to leave. But it just goes to show that sometimes all the pundits can be wrong. And they were all wrong. And as you, as you may know, there was a 52%, 48% majority in favour of departure. This was a shock. It was a shock to us. And it was also a surprise to those, to many of those, maybe most of those, who had campaigned to leave. 
It was also a big complication for British politics because there had been no definition provided for the voters in the referendum. How could there have been? There was no definition of what leave meant. Did it mean that we would, the United Kingdom would adopt the model of Norway, be outside the European institutions, but nonetheless fully integrated into the single market? Did it mean that we were going to become like Canada, outside the institutions, outside the single market, but with a free trade agreement governing um, our trade relations? Uh, did it mean we were going to be like Turkey, that we would have a customs union arrangement with the European Union, but be outside the institutions? Um, after months of debate, and there really were, there was a huge amount of debate within the, within the United Kingdom before we could even begin, before we could begin to negotiate the withdrawal and our future relationship with the European Union, we had to have some idea of what we wanted from it. And it took a long time to work out amongst ourselves, between ourselves, in the government, in Parliament, across the country, what, uh, what we wanted from Brexit. But in the end, I think we've come up with a kind of broad definition of our objectives which is that although we're leaving the European Union institutions, we're not disengaging from Europe. We will want to have the maximum engagement possible outside those institutions. So we want a deep and special partnership with the European Union in the future, covering not just trade and the economy, but also security, cooperation, foreign affairs cooperation, and cooperation in many other areas. So really none of the previous models that exist for so-called third country relations with the European Union would work for the United Kingdom if we were able to achieve what we want. But will we be able to achieve what we want? The Brexit process is extremely uncertain and it remains very uncertain. What we do know is that we are due to leave the European Union on the 29th of March in 79 days time and Parliament has legislated, the British Parliament has legislated that we should leave on that date. So in order not to leave on that date, Parliament would have to undo the legislation this has already made that we should leave on that date. So that date looks pretty set, although uh, back to rule number one of Fight Club, if you know the film, <laughs> rule number one of Brexit is nothing is certain. But, okay, we leave on the 29th of March. Second thing, we have, or the British government, has negotiated the terms of its withdrawal from the, from the European Union. We haven't negotiated the terms of our future relationship, but we have an agreement for how we leave, and that agreement essentially deals with um, the rights that... British citizens that live in the European Union will continue to enjoy, and the rights that European Union citizens that live in the UK will continue to enjoy, and broadly speaking it means rights those citizens have now will continue for them, so they, their lives won't be greatly affected. It also uh, provides for the cost of departure. We have to pay quite a large bill uh, to leave. Um, which has been calculated basically on the outstanding contributions we would have been making to the European Union in those areas of activity that continue until they, until they stop. Um, <coughs> it also provides, uh, and this is rather important, if slightly technical point, it provides for the United Kingdom to be treated as though it were a European Union member state for a period of at least 21 months after we leave. This is being called the implementation period, and it's there to allow us time to negotiate the future relationship that we will have with the European Union uh, thereafter. Because clearly, between now and March 29th, there is not nearly enough time to decide what our future relationship should be in detail. And it also, uh, this withdrawal agreement contains provisions dealing with Northern Ireland. You may know about the issue of the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, and in also Gibraltar, 
and the sovereign based areas on Cyprus. The next step uh, in the process of Brexit is that on Tuesday next week, the House of Commons in the British Parliament will vote on whether to accept or reject the withdrawal agreement that has been negotiated. If the Parliament accepts the withdrawal agreement, it will be relatively straightforward that we will leave on the 29th, but continue to be treated as though we were a member state for the implementation period up until at least the end of 2020, and that thereafter we will, uh, with luck, have negotiated our future relationship with the European Union, where we will be outside the customs union, outside the single market, but nonetheless have as deep and close an economic and security relationship with Europe as <coughs> possible. However, the question is, will the House of Commons vote for the deal? I don't know whether you follow this subject um, at the moment, whether you read any of the commentary on the subject, but if anybody has read any um, of the commentators or any of the journalists or the academics who are writing about Brexit, if anybody knows of anyone who at the moment is predicting that the House of Commons will vote for the package, you might want to raise your hand. I see no hands raised. <laughs> well, we don't know. We genuinely don't know what will happen. The government is campaigning fiercely uh, with MPs and with the country at large um, so that people write to their MPs and say, you must vote for the package. On the grounds that the package is the only certain way that we can be sure that Brexit will be achieved and that the UK will actually leave the European Union. Because without the package, the options don't look very attractive. One option is the United Kingdom leaves without a deal governing how we leave, a sort of a so-called disorderly Brexit. Some people say a hard Brexit. The hit, the damage, to Britain's reputation and to our economy could be quite serious in those circumstances. But it may be also that because of the risks and the potential damage, that Parliament will not allow us to leave on those terms and will somehow try and stop the process of departure. So it's also possible that there could be no Brexit. So unless the package is adopted, the Prime Minister and other members of the government are rightly pointing out the alternative is a hard, uncontrolled, disorderly Brexit or maybe no Brexit at all. Which is why this whole area is so fraught with uncertainty. Um, the economic consequences of the UK, for the UK rather, if um, Brexit happens in the short term, whether it's a hard or a soft Brexit, an orderly Brexit with a, an agreement, or a hard Brexit, or a disorderly Brexit without an agreement, uh, there, will be, there will be difficulties for the UK economy, um, varying in severity. But I'd just say this to, to this room, that the fundamental reasons for the British economy being strong are actually not connected to our membership of the European Union. Um, things like, why, why, is, why is British business reasonably successful? Why is Britain the fifth largest economy in the world? <coughs> we have stable democratic political institutions and a stable political culture. And, and that's not going to be changed whether or not we remain a member state of the European Union. We have an independent judiciary, we have respect for the rule of law, and we have a separation of powers between the judiciary and the executive. And that's not affected by whether or not we're a member state of the European Union. There is an openness and a tradition of openness in the UK towards international trade and international cooperation. And although some people see Brexit as a sign that we are less enthusiastic about that. 
Equally, many people who voted for Brexit voted because they wanted greater engagement with the world beyond Europe. So that I think, again, I'm reasonably confident that our openness to international trade and cooperation and competition, international competition, isn't going to end. And similarly, our, although we are changing our rules on immigration, we will remain a country that needs immigration to power our economy, and we will continue to be open to people to come to people with the right skills and qualifications to come to the United Kingdom to find work there. And we continue to have world-class universities, and again, those universities, um, their standing should not be affected by whether or not we are a member state of the European Union. So I think there are reasons that after a period of adjustment, and the adjustment may be more or less difficult, depending on the terms in which we leave, um, after a period of adjustment, there are reasons for thinking that Britain will be able to survive and thrive outside the European Union. Last thing I want to say, and then I will stop, and I hope there may, might be some questions and we can continue for another half an hour or so. What is the effect of Brexit going to be on British-Turkish relations? It's easy to look at one area that will uh, immediately be a challenge, um, or maybe even two. The first one is that Britain has been a strong supporter of Turkey's European integration <laughs> as a member state of the European Union. From within the European Union, maybe it may be going too far to say we're a champion of Turkey, but we've certainly seen the strategic and other reasons why Turkey's accession and the journey towards accession is a good thing for the European Union and for Turkey. That voice within the European Union will no longer be there. <laughs> And I think that, will, that, will, that is undoubtedly, I think, a negative. Second thing, the trade that I spoke of, the fact that we are your second largest export market, over 90% of that trade passes through the European Union Customs Union. Of course, when the United Kingdom is outside the Customs Union, whether that's on March the 30th this year or at some point, in a couple of years' time, that we will need another arrangement for managing that trade. And we will need something that provides for the same ease of movement of trade that we enjoy at the moment, because we both benefit from, from the customs union. So there's a challenge for us there to put in place arrangements to enable our trade to continue to grow strongly as it has been in recent years. And I should say that um, the uh, British and Turkish governments have taken this issue very, very seriously. <coughs> we have established a trade working group of officials. And although, strictly speaking, under the terms of the UK's departure from Europe, we are not allowed yet to negotiate a new trade arrangement with Turkey, we are nonetheless doing all that we can <coughs> short of negotiations so that when the time comes, and we are able to negotiate, we can negotiate a, a new trade arrangement, a uh, self-standing free trade agreement, we hope, that will enable our very valuable <coughs> trade to continue in both directions. But there is at least a, there's an element of challenge there that I should point out. Um, just on the subject of trade, though, there are other things that we can do and that we can hope to develop, and are beginning to develop now, um, which are not related to European Union membership. British and Turkish companies can get huge value out of joint ventures within Turkey. This is beginning to happen more often, where complementary skills, lower overheads in Turkey, maybe transfer of technology from the UK to Turkey, means that um, that you have you know, mutually beneficial arrangements arrived at here. We're also looking at um, increasing the number of collaborations between British companies and Turkish companies in third countries. In particular, we think there's more we could do together in Africa countries, building infrastructure together, um, or, or maybe also in the Middle East. 
Uh, and there, in those circumstances, uh, it's possible for Turkish companies to benefit from UK export finance. Um, just a sentence on this, in case this, you know, this may be a bit technical, but uh, essentially, if you're a British, if you're a Turkish company, uh, there is a pot of uh, money worth three billion sterling available to Turkish companies if they're in infrastructure or industrial or healthcare projects, they're working in these areas, and they source 20% of the value of their project from the UK, they can benefit from UK export finance to help them cover the cost of the, of the project. That's a pretty, it's a pretty market-friendly <coughs> offer, and we look to Turkish companies to take this up in bigger numbers, whether they're working together with a British partner or, or otherwise. Um, a last couple of thoughts. Brexit means for the United Kingdom that we will no longer have the safety net or the comfort cushion of being a member state of the European Union in the way we as a country relate to the world as a whole. We will be much more responsible for our own fate and we will therefore have to make a greater effort to invest in bilateral relations with other countries. And it seems to me uh, very natural that for the most important countries of the world, for the G20 countries of the world, which of course includes Turkey, the United Kingdom will make an extra effort in the coming period to strengthen the bilateral relationship um, once, so that we're ready when we leave the <coughs> European Union to benefit from that. Of course, we will continue to be a partner of Turkey in other institutions, whether as allies in NATO, as partners in the Council of Europe, in the OSCE, and I've already mentioned the G20, and there are no doubt other organizations where we will be working together. And last thought, and I think this is, um, this may be a slightly uh, less solidly based thought, and it goes back to where I started about geography and the importance of geography in foreign relations. That once the, United, once the United Kingdom leaves the European Union, uh, we will, like Turkey, be a former imperial power, now a smaller nation state, <coughs> on the fringes or the margins of the giant that is the European Union, having to decide how much of what the European Union is doing that we want to copy and how much of what the European Union is doing we don't want to copy but to follow our own road. Turkey's been grappling with these issues for much longer than we have been, but the fact that we'll be in the similar position, albeit at opposite ends of the European Union, I think will make us believe that we have something strategic in common with one another again. And that may draw us, draw us together. And I think we'll have a lot to learn from your own experience of being a third country dealing with the European Union institutions. Um, and maybe we'll have some insights that we can bring from having recently been a member state. But whatever it is, I think that may draw us together. So the future after Brexit for British-Turkish relations is by no means all problems and difficulties. There are definitely some opportunities there. And I hope I've been able to shed light on a few of them. So thank you very much for listening. Now the suggestion is there might be a few questions. And um, do we probably have half an hour? <coughs> is that right? Almost half an hour. Um, so what I might just ask people from the floor. Will there be microphones for the one? There is a microphone. So the gentleman here has put his hand up. Uh, firstly, uh, welcome to our university. We are very much honored to have you here. Um, I'm going to. Uh, I'm, I have two questions that are. Uh, I have two.
two questions that are connected to each other. Uh, firstly, do you think that the deals uh, European Union will have uh, with Britain and Turkey about the trade routes between uh, United Kingdom and Turkey, would they be more costly just because, not just because, but as a main reason that Turkey has never been in United uh, European Union? So, uh, and my second question is, if that was the case, would uh, United Kingdom accept a, a trio of partnership between Russia, Turkey, and uh, use Russia as an alternative route of uh, international trade? Okay. Um, thank, you. thank you very much. It's uh, a very interesting question. Um, uh, because of the because Turkey's uh, is part of participates in the European Union Customs Union for goods uh, and processed agricultural products. Uh, in law, in trade law, what that means is that whatever future trade agreement we have with the European Union, we must have the same. We must have equivalent um, arrangements for trade with Turkey. So the terms of our trade for goods that go through the customs union will be will need to be identical. So in a way, because of the membership of the Customs Union, there isn't really an alternative for the UK other than to have a bilateral relationship, a bilateral free trade agreement that reflects the nature of the UK's relationship with the Customs Union. For goods outside the Customs Union, we have more freedom of manoeuvre. So for goods, that would be fresh fruit and vegetables, and then also for services and public procurement, we can come to our own bilateral relations, uh, our own bilateral arrangements. I don't think that we would see Russia as a natural route for our goods to pass through uh, into Turkey. And unfortunately, at the present time, we have our own difficulties with Russia, as well as a, you know, there, are, there are sanctions that are, that are on Russia because of its behavior in Ukraine. And because of the attempted assassination of Russians living in the UK last year, uh, the Skripal saga, which you may know about, relations between the UK and Russia are quite difficult and they, off, they go up and down rather a lot. So I think that would be rather a volatile route for, for the traffic of goods. But thank you for your question. Uh, gentleman in a white shirt there. Thank you for coming to our university again, dear Ambassador. I would like to ask a question about the immigrants. With that topic which has been brought by especially by the UK leader Nigel Farage I suppose in the in this time of Brexit well nowadays it seems that Europe is facing a huge migrant crisis across the continent and if I'm not mistaken the number of immigrants in London has surpassed the native uh, population that living there and I would like to learn your stance on the immigrant issue in the Europe especially in Britain. Thank you. Well, thank you for that question. Um, you're quite right that in the Brexit debate, one of the most important issues was the issue of immigration. As you know, within the European Union, there are no limits on movement of people. Indeed, the free movement of people is one of the fundamental uh, principles of European Union membership. And what some people argued for was that the United Kingdom had so many um, new people coming uh, to the country that um, the strain put on the uh, public services and the speed of change in Britain's towns and cities uh, was such that this was becoming intolerable for the what you might call the local people, if you call them that. I mean, it's an argument. I don't say whether it's right or whether it's wrong, but it's an argument. And it definitely got some traction. It was an argument that had some force in the debate. And uh, it is definitely the case that as a result of Brexit, one of the first things the government is doing, the British government is doing, is introducing a new immigration policy where we will have <coughs> controls on the numbers of people that come into the country to find work. Um, and the big difference between the European Union system and the new British system will be that your country of origin will no longer be important. If you have the right skills 
and you have a job offer in the UK, and it pays enough, it looks like a genuine job offer, and there may well be a threshold for how much the, how valuable the job is, um, then it, it seems that that would be the basis on which people will be able to migrate to work in the UK. Of course, we need not just high paid skilled workers, we need people who work in the hospitality industry, in hotels, we need people who work in agriculture, where most of these jobs are not well paid, and they're not highly skilled, but they're still important. So we will need an immigration system that covers those, those parts of the economy as well. So it's not just an immigration system for, for highly skilled, well paid, well paid people. Um, at the moment, the new immigration proposals are being debated in the UK, and the new law, I think, will be introduced probably later this year or beginning of, beginning of next year. And then we'll know better what our system is like. But the key thing, I think, for maybe people in this room is to know that a Turkish national will not be disadvantaged in the future from a French national or a German national um, or any national of an EU member state if they wish to come to the UK. Everyone will be treated on the same basis. Um, I'm looking for a woman, if I may. Thank you, Lady Bear, Scott. Uh, thank you uh, and welcome again. Um, you mentioned about uh, benefits of uh, Turkey's participation to EU. Uh, <coughs> what are those benefits? What's your personal opinion? I, uh, I would like to hear. Well, this is dangerous territory in a way for a foreigner to talk about what are the benefits for your own country. <laughs> but um, I think there are some, I think there definitely are benefits. Um, if you look at the economic side, I think if you talk to Turkish industry, uh, most Turkish industry will say that the standards that the European Union sets in its regulations for industry force Turkish industry to raise its own standards. And those standards then make Turkish industry globally more competitive. Um, so I think that participation in the customs union has forced Turkish industry to perform better and to higher standards. I think, it, I think um, if I know my history correctly, when it was first proposed that Turkey might join the customs union for goods, there was quite a lot of opposition within Turkish industry that felt that it would, not be, able, it would be wiped out by the superior industry in Europe. But it just goes to show if you have hard-working people, good management, and you have political will in the government to support you, that actually you can turn around expectations, you can outperform European competition in many areas, and you can become an exporting success story, which is what a lot of Turkish business has done through participation in the customs union. So I think that's one area where the results are demonstrable. I think also, for Turkey, and this is a more controversial area, I think in the question of sort of governance, um, uh, rule of law, what you might call fundamental freedoms, uh, there are certain standards the so-called Copenhagen criteria that the European Union sets. And these have generally proved useful as targets for countries that wish to become member states. And that those societies in which, if, they, I mean, if, if those societies want to be countries that meet those standards and uh, live those values, then, then the accession process is uh, it's a useful mechanism for achieving that. It gives a reason we're trying to achieve that. Of course, I think in Turkey's case, people say we want to achieve these things anyway for their own sake because they are good for us. So you don't need to have accession to achieve these. But having the accession process provides objective, well, yeah, I think objective, the European Commission could be objective, objective scrutiny of whether or not you are making this progress. And also quite a lot of uh, support in terms of mentoring and training uh, and funding that allows institutions to develop in those lines. So I think that could be helpful as well. No doubt there are other areas. Yes, gentlemen there. Uh, firstly, thank you for coming. Uh, I have a question about visa. Uh, you said that uh, Britain, uh, Brit you and Turkey have very good relationship, but on the other hand, uh, for example, if we have green passport, we can go to all the European countries, but England wants to ask visa. 
Yeah. If we are partnership, can can we go your come your country without any visa? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm recording your answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the answer is uh, that. Um, and I actually we have a specialist in the, from the British Embassy on this subject in the audience who can tell me if I get this wrong. But generally, whether or not there is a visa system in place is a function of whether or not there is a the, this function of the degree of risk that people who come to your country would not um, only come to your country for the purposes of which they say. So, for example, there is a sufficient degree of risk that people from Turkey, indeed other countries where we have visa regimes, if they say they're coming for a tourist visit, a percentage of them will not just come as tourists, they will seek to stay in the country and find work. And that's why we have a visa system to try and sort of regulate um, the terms on which people come. I don't think under the new, in the future, any foreseeable future that I can foresee at the moment, that um, that's going to change. We're going to require a visa system for the vast majority of countries in the world because of the risk that a certain percentage of people would abuse a system without, without visas. And I'm afraid that's just the, the world that we live in. But what I will say to you is that, um, you know, Turkish nationals, when they're, when they're looking to come to the UK and they apply for their visa, or if they're looking to come to the UK to work, I mean, all people who are not British, if, they're coming, if they want to work in the UK, whether they're from the United States or from any of the European Union member states, <coughs> or from Singapore, or wherever they are, Australia, they will all require work visas. And Turkish people will be on exactly the same basis as all those other uh, country nationals in the future for coming to work. Yes. Um, dear Pastor, uh, welcome to our country and to our university. My name is Yunus Duman. Uh, I would like to ask you about uh, the new agreements and weapon trade deals with Saudi Arabia after the Kashyyyki incident. Uh, do you consider this as an effect of Brexit or do you consider it as something else? Thank you. I'm not entirely sure what weapons deals or arms deals you're referring to. Um, I'm not trying to avoid your let me try and uh, try, let me try and answer your question, um, if I may, uh, without knowing exactly what deal you may have in mind. Um, I mean, Saudi Arabia is a very important uh, partner for the UK and for many other countries in the Middle East, and certainly the UK has had uh, a very important defence sector relationship with Saudi Arabia, and the, the support that Saudi Arabia gave us in 1990 in pushing um, Saddam Hussein's Iraqi forces out of Kuwait and similarly the support we got in 2003 in the more controversial uh, military action against uh, Iraq then wouldn't have been possible without the support of Saudi Arabia. So in big strategic terms Saudi Arabia has been an ally of the UK and the UK. Now I, I must be nervous, I've not my glass of water. An ally of the UK um, I'm just trying to save your computer here. <laughs> this is, I'm not avoiding the question. Yes, if I check it, thank you. Oh, Lordy, okay. So this hasn't, this isn't the Saudi intelligence service. <laughs> so, uh, I think the Khashoggi, the, you know, the, the hideous murder of Khashoggi has been a bit of a shock to all of us because we want a strong relationship with Saudi Arabia, but also that kind of behavior is intolerable. So the issue is, what is the correct response that will help promote the necessary reforms that we want to see in Saudi Arabia to avoid that being a, an instrument of Saudi foreign policy, the assassination of people they don't like in foreign countries, what is the right response, which nonetheless allows us to maintain our strategic uh, partnership or friendship that we have with Saudi Arabia. And that will be the calculation that we make. And of course, somewhere in there is the very sensitive issue of defense sales. And there will be issues about you know, what defense sales are appropriate in those circumstances and what may not be. And I don't know in detail where we stand on all of that, but it's a very important subject, so thank you for raising it. And I'm sorry I've 
brought down the university <laughs> computer system in <once. laughs> <laughs> Do we have time for one more? Uh, yes, five plus two minutes. Five plus five minutes left, okay. Is there another uh, woman who'd like to ask, ask a question? If not, there's a gentleman here. Tissue. 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 Tissue.
uh, before just uh, you finish your uh, speech. But and I revised my uh, question and uh, I want to uh, mention about the rising populism in uh, EU countries. So, do you think uh, what happens in the Britain uh, related to the, the rising populism in the United <coughs> States? Is it sort of uh, accession or reflection? Uh, I think it's, it's all about. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. And the gentleman over here. Uh, welcome, first of all. Uh, I'd like to ask a question about, uh, you know that last year there was a march uh, through Parliament, uh, thousands of hundreds of people, for uh, a second vote about the Brexit deal. Uh, I would like to hear your thoughts about uh, this. And an additional information, did you know that the person who ran the campaign, uh, the Boris Johnson, is kind of related as his uh, grandfather, but who... Um, uh, fight against the, uh, the ideology of the founder of Turkey's Republic, Mustafa Kemal. And that was just an additional information. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think Boris, if I'm right, I might be wrong, I think Boris Johnson's great-grandfather, wasn't he hanged? He was a... Lynched. He was lynched. It's worse, he was lynched, yes. So um, he came to a sticky end. No parallels. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> so, so, gentleman over there who asked about uh, populism. Rising populism. Sorry? Rising populism rising across po the world. Rising yeah. populism, yes. Uh, was, whether, was, was there a connection between Brexit and uh, the election of Trump in the context <coughs> of rising populism? Uh, I think there is a connection. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm talking here not as a government official, but just personally. I think after the 2008 financial crash, there was a sense of disillusionment in many countries in the West that the system was not serving the um, people as a whole, that those who were able to benefit from the system could get rich, and that those and there were too many people being left behind. And I think it is a problem with modern-day capitalism, and I'm not, this is not a party political point, but I think there is a, modern, there is a problem with modern-day capitalism, which is, and the problem is how do you share the wealth fairly across society so that everybody feels included and everybody can benefit? And we haven't really found the answer in most of our countries as to how to do this well. Certainly we haven't found that answer in the United Kingdom. And I think the vote in the United <coughs> States for Mr. Trump was partly, I think, driven by people who felt they wanted to send a message to the federal government that they were dissatisfied with the, with the results of federal government uh, in this respect uh, in the United States. So I think in that sense there is, a, there is a link in populism. I'd hesitate to go further than that. There are academics in this room who will understand these things better than, better than I do. <coughs> And the question about, sorry, the question about the second referendum. What do I think about a second referendum? Well, the Prime Minister, Theresa May, is adamantly against it. Um, the most, I think, most of the government don't want it, although there are one or two members of the government who have said that if Parliament is unable to resolve what the future should be in our relationship with the European Union, whether we should be whether we should remain in, whether we should leave, how we should leave. If Parliament can't decide that, then maybe you have to have a second referendum in those circumstances. The difficulty with the second referendum, I think, is at least a couple of difficulties. Uh, and it goes back to points, sorry, actually points weren't made at this room, points we were, we were discussing over lunch. But if your political system is essentially a parliamentary system, every time you have a referendum, I think to a degree it undermines the authority of Parliament. So there's a sense in which referendums are or should be regarded as alien in a parliamentary system and only really used in the rarest of occasions. And even then, I'm not sure there's always a justification. But of course, that's not, that's not the position of the British government because we, you know, we, we had a referendum. And there is a sense, I think, in which referendums are damaging to the authority of Parliament. 
but perhaps more importantly, if you've had a referendum, um, people who didn't like the result can campaign to have a second referendum, but that's not because they really want a second referendum, they just want to overturn the result of the first referendum, if that makes sense. I mean, it's not because of a failure of democracy the first time around, because the referendum, had, in UK terms, had a relatively high turnout, over 70%, I think. Um, and there was, you know, the, 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 it was conducted in a perfectly fair way. Um, there was a, there's been a bit of discussion since about whether the, the, the uh, Leave campaign um, got money from sources they shouldn't have or spent slightly more than they ought to have done. But essentially, it was a very fair campaign. And people had the opportunity freely to decide, and they freely decided. If they freely decided differently after a second referendum, you might then have the leavers saying, well, let's make it the best of three. Let's have a third referendum. I mean, away, you know, where does this stop? Um, and I think uh, for many people, they would feel if the political system said, okay, we're going to have a second referendum, they would, they would feel <coughs> disengaged. Uh, they voted, they will feel they voted on the issue and they now expect the results of their vote to be implemented. And to go back to them and ask them the question again, as though it was they made, as though they made a mistake, as though they didn't understand what it was about, is insulting. And I sort of, I mean, I kind of get that. I, you know, I, I voted to remain, not to leave. But still, I think, going back with a second referendum to the people now, would be hard to stomach. Uh, you know, I think if, you, if you're a serious country, you have a serious referendum on a serious issue, just because you don't like the outcome, or you think it's going to do you damage. That's not a, a reason not to do what the people have said they were going to do. Otherwise, you know, what's the, what was the point? But, but that's, what was, that's, that's, sorry, that's my personal view. It's not necessarily all British government policy. Very good. I think we've, we've come to the end of our time, haven't we? Thank you very much for your question.